As you know, we've been preaching through uh, 1 Peter. Uh, this morning, Carl is preaching. I'm really excited to have Carl preaching. Carl, you know, preached uh, here for years, once a month. So he feels like an associate pastor here at the sanctuary. So it's great to have Carl preaching this Sunday. Uh, last, We'll be back in 1 Peter next week. Last week, uh, we talked about the descent into hell, or that's what theologians call it in 1 Peter chapters 3 and 4. And if you remember, I said part of our problem is that we uh, think of these three different ideas with this one word, hell. And hell number one, we said well, you could think of it over here, and it's the apparent absence of God. And I say apparent absence, Hades or Sheol, because there's no place that God is not. And then over here we said there's this other thing that, that is like the consuming fire, and that's the very presence of God, because God is light and fire and, and life. And then we said there's, and we called this hell number two, but a better word for hell number two is heaven. And then we talked about hell number three, which is here in the middle, the place where heaven meets Hades or the outer darkness, which is uh, the judgment of God, which is really a picture of what uh, Jesus did. He was crucified at the edge of the city at the northern end of the, of the valley of Gehenna. And uh, Peter says that Jesus uh, went and preached to the spirits in prison, uh, the folks that disobeyed, that didn't get on the ark in the days of Noah, but they're not the only people. They're not the only spirits in prison. Um, scripture says that, David says this, that he was entangled in the chains of Sheol. That Sheol starts, the grave starts on the surface of the earth and continue afterwards. And so this morning, I thought maybe um, we could just contemplate that a bit. So if you would, close your eyes, all right? And I, I want you to think of a, a place in your life where you feel confused. You just don't know which way to go. And now maybe it's the same place, but a place or situation, something in your life, maybe something you've never ever told anybody, where you just feel wrong. It's just wrong. In other words, it's not right. Now, this can be the same place or another place. But think of a place where you just, you don't feel like God is there. I think the way the Bible would say that is it, it just feels unholy to you. That, that doesn't necessarily mean that it is, but it feels that way to you. Now this may be the same place or another place, but a, a place or time that feels like it just cannot be redeemed. You see, I think that's what the Bible means by Hades or Sheol, death. And, and to live in that place, um, well, I think that's what Scripture means by sin. It's that place of separation. And so when you confess sins, you're just giving that place over to Jesus, to the presence of God. And so maybe you can do this now, just in the silence of your heart. Okay, so this isn't speaking out loud. But just invite Jesus into that place. But, but now let me remind you of something. Scripture says that he is our wisdom, that God has made him our wisdom. This is in 1 Corinthians 1. God has made him our wisdom. So you're inviting wisdom into that place where you're confused. And he is our righteousness. So you're inviting him into that place that feels wrong. 
Paul says he's our wisdom, our righteousness, our sanctification. So you're inviting holiness into that unholy place. And Paul says he's our redemption. So you're inviting redemption into that place that feels like it cannot be redeemed. And according to Peter, he descended and preached to the spirits in prison at least 2,000 years ago. So this is the wild thing. He's there already. So just say in your heart, Lord Jesus, I give this place over to you. You're saying, Lord Jesus, be my wisdom, be my righteousness, be my sanctification, be my redemption. And what is Jesus? Well, Jesus isn't a what. He's not a list of rules that you can go to church and get and then apply to your life. He's not knowledge about the good. He is the good. He became a life-giving spirit, says Paul. So he's a spirit in your flesh. And Paul said that we become one spirit with him. So when you talk to him, when you invite him into that place, you become an incarnation. That means in flesh. Do you, the body of Christ. And so talk to Jesus about this place. Live in this place with Jesus. Move from this place. Out of this place with him, not away from him. You see, he is the judgment of God. And the evil one is trying to convince you to run away from the judgment of God. But God is wanting to give you his judgment. And it's good. And so, Lord God, we thank you that you are our wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption. We thank you that you are the one that descends into these places of darkness with light, into these places where we feel lost. And lo and behold, you are the way. You descend into our death with your life, and so we hand ourselves over to you. And Lord, I pray that through your Spirit, you would keep reminding us moment by moment, day by day, to come and sit in your presence and to hear what you have to say. Not what the accuser has to say, but what you have to say about us. And then I thank you through the power of your Spirit, you help us to believe what you say about us. And what you say about us is so profoundly good. And so, Lord Jesus, I thank you that you draw us into a place where we live in gratitude. Um, and we don't make the life happen, but the life happens through us because you have purchased us, you have created us, and now you inhabit us. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for living your life through us. Father, I thank you for uh, Carl. And I thank you for the, for the gift that he's been to me and that he's been to all of us. And Lord, we pray that you would open our hearts to hear what um, Carl has to say, that, we, uh, that what, what you have to say through Carl. So Lord, we pray your blessings on Carl. We thank you for Carl. And we ask, Lord God, that um, you would manifest your life in us. I thank you that you, you tell us you will. And uh, Lord, I thank you that that you even ask us to ask so we can say thank you for what you do. So, Lord, all glory, praise, and honor goes to you. Um, and we pray all of this in Jesus' name. Oh, I want to thank you for one other thing. God, I want to thank you for the wonderful way that people gave at the end of this uh, last fiscal year. Um, Lord, I thank you for those that worship with us online, which are more than the ones that 
that are maybe here in this room. Well, they are. I thank you, Lord, that you are the one that holds us together, that, that um, you are the straw in, in the bricks. Because you once told me, Peter, you feel like you're trying to hold everything together, like you're making bricks without straw, and I'm the straw. So, Lord God, thank you that you're the straw, that you hold us together, that we belong to you. Um, in Jesus' name, amen. Well, it's nice to be back. Hey, how are you guys? Oh, goodness, I do that every time. All right, we're almost, there we go. Oh, there, oh there's two. Well, there's the issue. Thank you. Um, I will say, I, I love, Peter, I love when you do the call to worship. I just, I love, you can give the shortest sermon and it feels like we could just close in prayer. But it does freak me out a little bit when you're quoting from Peter. Because I, it sounds like you're talking in the third person. <laughs> you know, Peter says, and it just seems so weird. <laughs> We're a little, a little full of ourselves. Hey, I'm going to, um, I want to give you, I'm going I'm to make a statement, okay? And it's, it's likely you're not going to agree with that statement. That's fine. Um, but kind of... I want you to kind of look for a little bit of um, support for your position. And, and so, in your, if you happen to disagree, think of, a, of a, maybe a verse from the New Testament that might support your, you know, your perspective or where you might disagree a little bit. Or maybe think of like a, a story or an anecdote or something from the life of Jesus. Either or or both. That'll be fine. Okay? So, let me get, here, here's, my, here's the statement. God does not want you to ever be angry. So that's the statement. I'm, I'm, I'm reading this statement. God does not want you to ever be angry. Okay. Did, could you, did you, is there, you know, maybe you had a little reaction to that, and that's okay. You're going, I don't know. That sounds weird. What, what might have been a verse that you came up with? Uh, here, you know what? You don't have to say it out loud. I'll tell you the verses. Here's what you thought. You thought, I, for some of you at least, you thought that time in Ephesians where it says, be angry and sin not. And then if you thought of a story from the life of Jesus, here's, here's the story I think you might have thought about. When Jesus went into the temple and he turned over all the tables and he made his whip. Those of us that are of, of that age, remember when Johnny Carson used to do the Karnak thing, you know, yeah, so I feel like I'm doing Karnak, when it's, and the reason I, I guess I think you might have had that was that was my reaction. That was how I would have thought of that. We're going to answer in some small way this question, is, is the Bible pro-anger? And so I'm, I'm, let, me, let me read some of the verses that, that might indicate that anger is, is dangerous and something God doesn't want us to handle ourselves. And then we'll do the other side. Uh, let's start with the, the verse that we've, we've already talked about a little bit, that one in Ephesians 4, 26 and 27. And I think it'll come up here. So, in your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you're still angry. And do not give the devil a foothold. Now, in terms of a kind of a, a, well, anyhow, we'll keep going. But then later, it's, it's interesting, we, we're pretty familiar with the first part. I'm not so sure we're as familiar with just the context, which is just a couple of verses later. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger. So, in this, in this verse, the one that we kind of thought might push against the idea, there's at least a time period, and... Within that time period, we are maybe, if we don't sort of adhere to that time period, giving the devil an opportunity for something, which I will later testify in my own life has been a true, very true statement. And then just a couple verses later, he just is pretty point blank, get rid bitterness, anger, rage. There's another one here that's maybe even better for us to comprehend out of, out of the book of James, James chapter 1. My dear brothers and sisters, um, I got to <laughs> take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become 
angry. Because human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. There's, there's more. There's more. Matthew 22, Jesus says, if anybody is angry with their brother or sister, they're in danger of judgment. Colossians 3 says the similar words, as it often does to Ephesians, where it says, get rid of anger. Okay, that's one side of the column, the, the side that would caution us about anger. And now, so now let's, we're going to pull up some of the verses that, that might be in favor of how humans can handle anger. Oh, I'm sorry, there are no verses like that. <laughs> oh, I, I'm sorry, I wasn't being very clear, was I? Yeah, yeah. You, know, you thought something was going to pop up. You're kind of hoping something would pop up, right? <laughs> oh, I'm, I'm sorry, that wasn't very nice, Tasha. I'm sorry. I, I really, she, she was sweating for a minute. <laughs> she sounds a little angry. Yeah. We're going to talk a little bit that, uh, on some of the loopholes. And one of the loopholes is irritated. But anyhow, we'll talk about that later. Um, yeah, I, I, I'm, I haven't found any. I haven't found any that would affirm that anger is something that we as humans are able to manage or handle. I read a, I read a book, I uh, started a couple months ago and then re-listened to it. It's just a little book, it's not, I don't, not scholarly or anything, but the book's called Unoffendable. It's by a guy named Brant Hansen, very interesting, a very good communicator. And it has bothered me quite a bit. And his premise in the book is that we need to rethink our whole perspective on anger. And so it's given me this personal sort of deep dive. And I'm going to share a little bit of that journey that I've been on. But I can tell you this, that as I've done this bit of a deep dive, I've come to realize that my anger has been an undercurrent in my life that I did not know was there. And it has caused me more heartache and pain, trouble, that I had ever been willing to acknowledge. You see, here's the, the problem I have. I have an unblemished record of righteous anger. Unbl I'm telling you, I, I, I'm not being, this isn't hyperbole. I have never in my life been angry where I could not prove to you that I had the right to be angry. It doesn't matter whether it's irritated or to the most extreme outbursts of my anger. A hundred percent of the time, I could to this day even go back, I could defend and tell you why I had the right in that moment to be justified. I'll give you a couple of examples from my life, and I'm going to be honest with you. Usually, I, 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 I like to be as transparent, and I'm fairly open about my life as best I can. I'm not in this conversation. I'll share some stories with you. I can't share with you my deepest stories. You could handle it. I couldn't. That's just my confession. Here, here's one. Wasn't that long ago. I'll just say the word Walmart. <laughs> That's probably enough. I mean, just from trying to park. <laughs> I was just thinking this week, a guy, and this is exactly how my thought process went. He took my parking place. <laughs> That's, I mean, I, I'm not lying. That's exactly the way. And, and my response was what? That's my parking place. I had the blinker on. I have the right to be angry. Trying to find something in Walmart. How do they not know how to keep up with I don't understand. The whole experience. But here's the one that I want to call your attention to. Is at some times they get, the lines get pretty long. 
and I happen to choose poorly, which I often do. And I, I chose very poorly. And now this line is, and do you keep pace with the person you could have been behind in the line next to you? Okay, all of, see, is your blood pressure just a little bit? You know what I'm saying, okay. Okay, so I'm, I'm in this line, and the lady, everybody's struggling, and I don't understand why, and then the, I'm almost there, one person in front of me. She's got a lot of things. She has coupons. <laughs> but here's the part that is, is, everything has been rung through, everything's in a bag, and then the cashier announces the total. And it's not until she announces the total that this woman opens her purse. We've had all this time. Now, if she were going to pull out her credit card, that's fine. But that's not what she's going to do, is it? She's going to begin to write a check. And she gives the check. And then we have to wait while she gets out her license. It, do you, you understand? That's wrong. <laughs> like, there's no, like, there's nowhere in the universe this is a, the way we behave. I, I still remember we were driving, and I, I, I can remember even where we were. We were it was on um, I-25, I think. Anyhow, I, it doesn't matter, but I-25 tends to always be congested. And it, long, long line, and... And I see in my, my mirror, there's a, and I, can, I still see it, this big white truck is coming down the emergency lane, bypassing everybody. And so I pull over into that lane. My, my wife says, what are you doing? I'm making the world better. <laughs> I, 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 I'm making things right. This is... Just this morning, I, I had my sermon all done, and I went to print it. And as I'm printing it, my wife says, the printer's not working. Now, please understand, I, I'm not an irrational person. I don't get angry for no reason. The printer's in her office. She's the only one who has this information. She doesn't tell me this until I have to leave and within a few minutes to come here. You understand why I would be mad. And then she begins to offer suggestions. Well, could you just bring your computer and set it up there? Okay, I, maybe irritated is, is not the same, but it sure feels the same inside. And then funny, I'm coming to preach on anger, and I know that irritation is just the same thing. And I'm beginning to feel, I'm really angry at her. God. It's really God's fault. Yeah. <laughs> but he's the one who told me to marry her. Is that what you mean? No, I'm kidding. Anyhow, here, here's what I'm saying is, this is human. This is what it means to be human, is to be faced every day with an experience that will elicit in you some response most likely of being angry. Why? Why is this a problem? There's been lots of research done on this topic but about morality, but here let me just say this to you. On average, 90% or more of people believe that they are morally superior to the average person. Anger is rooted in that statistic. That 90% of us believe we are morally better than just your average person. It's rooted, I get angry because you see, I have this ability to be omniscient. I know what people's motives are. I can know when somebody's being rude. I know when somebody's being selfish. I know when April's being thoughtless because I'm omniscient. I can read those things. 
I believe that I am fair and just. That when I feel something, it's because my obviously correct barometer of what is good and true and just has been violated. I, I, I'm sorry to say this, but I know how everyone should vote. I know what everyone should actually believe. You see, I believe I'm good. You know that story I was telling you about the driver, the guy who went, it's funny, I, 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 I sometimes forget that there's another time when I was right. And it was when we were, the kids were little and we bought tickets to the circus. Remember, it would just be at the old, you know, that Coliseum, and you're, again, I'm trying to make that, trying to get off I-25 to get onto I-70 to get off to the Coliseum, and it is backed for miles. And I bought tickets. Did I mention that? So I'm, I'm invested. And so I just pull into the emergency lane, and I just go. Now, in my case, that was okay, because I had the tickets. You understand? But the person who had the white truck and would have done, it didn't matter to me, why would I care if he went past me on the emergency? But that was wrong. Here's why we get angry. In, in some level. This, this sounds weird. But sometimes anger has this idea that I should be God. Or maybe to say it in a better way, I can't really trust God. I can't trust that he can take care of me. I have to do something. And what I found in this, thinking through this, is, oh my gosh, this sounds terrible. I've been a, a pastor and all that for a long, long, long time. I've really never questioned that. I never noticed that. Here, here's some things that are helping me. And one is, I've begun to challenge for the first time, honestly, for the very first time, this idea of righteous anger. As I said earlier, and I was being a little silly, I, I've, I've never questioned that my anger wasn't justified. And that's what I'm beginning to, to process a little bit. It's really interesting if you, if you take any of the sin lists, that there are a few in the Bible, um, some of you've heard about seven deadly sins. That's not actually, I don't think that's really a technical list, but somebody's compiled some, but some from Proverbs. But here's one that's fairly, fairly accessible to us. Um, we're more familiar with it from the positive expression, what we call the fruits of the Spirit. In other places this happens, but here's the, the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, long, you know, all that. Okay, But before that, there is this list called the, the, the fruits of the flesh, we'll call it. Walk by the Spirit and you'll gratify the desires of the flesh. And it, it says this, the acts of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, witchcraft, hatred, discord, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, so on. Anger is the only one we ever attempt to put the word righteous in front of. We never would say righteous immorality, righteous witchcraft, white, you know, righteous debauchery. And it gets, it, and I understand, it, it, and I'm processing this, it's, it's, it can be confusing because here's one of the, the hurdles we have. And that is that God gets angry. There is such a thing as righteous anger. But that isn't our world to live in. That's not on our job description, by the way. But it is on God's. But it's okay. It's okay that God has some things he can handle and he can manage that we can't. It doesn't mean they're bad. It means that it's too dangerous for us. We would never know how to do it. It would be giving a child dynamite. Uh, the other example of that is vengeance. And isn't it interesting if you think about, when we think of the word vengeance, we think of the word anger, and we think about our God. 
Can you imagine that the way in which vengeance and anger looks for him is anything the way it would look for us? I'm ready for the guy who cuts me off in traffic. I fantasize, his tire blows out in the car, like in some sci-fi movie, just starts hurling into the air and just dissolves in a ball of fire. That seems fair. (laughs) Stuffing anger is not the same as getting rid of anger. Anger's tough. A lot of you, like me, grew up in homes that were violent. And anger is a theme in a violent home. And almost always, what it means is one person in power can have all the anger they want, and they can display it in any way they want, at any time they want, and at your expense. But if you display the tiniest bit, that will unleash all that wrath. So I, I, I still, to this day, struggle with how to with the anxiety I feel when I'm when people around me begin I sense anger is about to happen but I know that just trying to ignore it trying to make it go away was not helpful here's something that's been helpful for me maybe be helpful for you for a moment just think of all the time all the times in your life where you've been really angry and you've expressed that anger. And make in your mind a couple of lists. Let's have the list where that worked out really well for you. And let's have the list where that really, really caused so much deep, deep pain in your life. Again, Karnak here knows which list is longer, right? What's helped me now when I, because there's not a day that goes by, I don't have a little bit of a trigger. I don't feel at least irritated or something. And I'm trying to tell myself, if you do something in this moment, you have no track record that's ever worked out for you. You don't have one story, Carl, where acting in this moment has been helpful for you or for the people you love. Not one. Not one. Okay. What do we do? What do we do? I'm going to give you two words that the Bible uses over and over, but often I believe are misunderstood. What's the way out, basically? Here's the way out. And your therapist, and I'm not against, I think... I'm not, I'm not, I want to be careful. I'm not trying to offer a, a, a quick fix to something. But these words can be fleshed out over years. I'm going to tell you this. It's going to sound really harsh. I'm going to tell you to repent and forgive. What do I do about my anger? I repent and I forgive. Now, repentance, I believe, is the most misunderstood word maybe in the scriptures. At least in the way that we use it. Because here's how we hear the word repent almost 100% of the time, and I still hear it, even Bible scholars use it this way, that what we hear repent, here's what we think. I promise I'm going to do better next time. I promise I'm going to try harder to quit doing that. That's not what repentance is. Repentance is always, in a sense, goes back to that very first story in the garden, the, the very story that I was sort of referencing when I was telling you how I kind of feel like I'm God and that's why I can be right. Repentance is the moment I acknowledge, oh my gosh, I'm trying to be God. I'm not God. I was wrong. And he was right. He has a better way. Repentance is this, this moment when I acknowledge, oh yeah, I was wrong. And almost always there's some, it seems to me like there's this thread that I feel like I'm God. And here's the harder part, is to forgive. I don't know how you feel about this. This I, I don't, I'm trying to get comfortable with this idea that forgiveness 
is, is not simply my dealing with a, an experience I've had with a person, but it's a way in which I carry myself in the world. In other words, and maybe this is theologically wrong, but I pre-forgive. I'm a forgiving person. That God's asked me to enter the world already forgiving. God knows that I live in a world that's got all kinds of stuff going on and pain and brokenness. And he asked my response to that, one of my responses, to be forgiveness. Imagine, imagine anything that we've believed we needed anger to do. We can think of our current world as it relates to politics or government or climate or how you run your marriage or your, whatever it is. What I'm advocating, what I'm saying is I, God's not ac asking us to be inactive. Just the opposite. What God's saying is what would it look like if anger wasn't what was motivating and behind and driving and energizing the action? What if it was another story? What if not trying to me be in charge of making things right, but I entered into my, my political conversations with compassion and sorrow. This thing that the Bible calls love. Imagine any situation where you've imagined that anger was going to be your friend. And anger is what you needed to make it happen. And imagine there's something else that could be energizing you. I want to close and I want to go back to the very first story that I had you think about, which is the story of Jesus in the temple. Now, I, Jesus, there are some places where Jesus did get angry, it says that, but it's about people's unbelief. And it didn't result in, as far as I know, in that kind of action. But do you realize that in that whole narrative, it never once says that Jesus was angry? Now, he, could he have been? Yes, I don't know. But I'm saying it's possible that that's not what was driving Jesus. That the energy in the room wasn't his rage. That it was something else. And my hunch is it was something else. It was compassion. The reason Jesus wants us to get rid of anger is his compassion for us. Think of all, again, we'll go back to that list. Think of all the times you've been angry and you express that anger. Who suffered the most because of that? The person you wanted to make things, you know, you wanted to fix? Or you? Pretty much it's almost 100%, isn't it? It was you that suffered. I want to I wanna read for you a quote from Frederick Buechner. And he says, and he, he's talking about Frederick Buechner, about why anger is so difficult in our lives. Of the seven deadly sins, anger is possibly the most fun. To lick your wounds, to smack your lips over grievances long past, to roll your tongue, or to roll your tongue over the prospect of bitter confrontation still to come. Let me, can I pause just for a second? How many hours have I spent in my truck driving, and I'm having conversations with people I'm really mad at, and it just tastes so good? Because this conversation, I'm doing it exactly right. I've had time to think about it now. You didn't catch me off guard this time. Oh, have I got some good retorts now. To savor the last toothsome morsel, both the pain you are given and the pain you are giving back, in many ways it feels as if, as if it is a feast for a king. The chief drawback is that what you are wolfing down 
is you. The skeleton at the feast will be you. Jesus has come to save us from this skeleton. And I want to say that in this journey, as we begin to practice, we'll have to practice over and over and over. I've never in my life had a moment where I wanted to enter and and experience the practice of forgiving someone. And I just had that one time I had to do that. Some people have, I haven't had that. Often it's something that, and here's what I've noticed. Just in the last six weeks or so, those people are coming to mind much less often. But I don't savor it. I don't rethink conversations. I don't redo anything. I acknowledge that I'm not, I'm not good. I'm the guy who will judge, who would want somebody to be crucified for driving in the emergency lane, and then I'd be the same guy who would drive in that emergency lane. I can't handle judging the world. And I have a list of things I've been forgiven for that would fill this room. And so the the little gift I give of forgiveness is really for me in so many ways. Because the pressure of being God is just way too much. I love, one of my favorite things about my friends here at the sanctuary is that the, the sermon is always at the end. And it's, it is our focus and it is our collection. It answers every angsty question I have. It resolves all the conflict in this moment. Because Jesus bore it all for me. And on the night that he was deceived, we know that story that he, he broke the bread. You, you think about the guys around that table. And it seems he knows what the next 48 hours are going to look like. Let me ask you, would you be mad? Spent three years pouring into these guys. You've loved them more than they've ever been loved in their life. You've given them everything. Everything you've given them. Why is he not angry? Why does it say that in Hebrews that it was for the joy set before him that he did this? He's he's looking forward to this. Even in the midst of his own human pain. This is my body which is broken for you. And this is the blood of the, of the new covenant. The blue cups will be juice and the brown cups will be wine. But both symbolize the same thing. Did I do? Oh, I... Okay. Now, I'm, I'm a little pissed off because... <laughs> The blue pitcher was in front of the brown cups. I'm just kidding. That was my wife. Yeah, yeah, the woman you gave us. Yes, I hear you, Peter. All right, this will be great. This will be challenging. So I'm so sorry. Should I? I know this is wine. I got it. I got it. Okay, there we go. Okay. <laughs> this is the blood of the new covenant. This is, covenant is like a deal. You probably know that. You know, it's like a new deal. You see, they, they'd always, they had thought that, that this idea of, of forgiveness was on them. Get better, do better, repent harder, make better promises. Jesus says no. This is the new deal. I'll take care of it all. I'll see you in a whole new way. I offer forgiveness. So when we drink and eat, we do this in remembrance of him. Let me pray. Father, thank you for the joy that was set before Jesus. And that's us.
We're his joy. We're your joy. And you know that we like being angry. We like dabbling in it. And we can't handle it. Oh God, I continue to pray for me and for my friends here. Help us, help us address this. Help us look this in the eye. And God, the thing that feels oh, so hard for me, I, I, I don't know why, but help me find the joy in forgiving those that hurt me. And thank you for the way you went before us and you showed us the way. We do love you. Amen. Hey, when we're all finished here in just a moment, uh, Ted will be out f- up front if you'd like somebody to pray with you uh, today. And for our benediction, now may the God of peace, who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, equip you with every good for doing his will, and may he work in us what is pleasing to him through Jesus Christ. To him be glory forever and ever. Amen.